Support for this program is provided by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting and from viewers like you. Hello and welcome to Louisiana Public Square. I'm Beth Courtney, president of LPB. Moderating tonight's discussion on making schools safe is LPB news anchor Andre Morrow. Hi, Beth. Andre. Thank you so much. You know, this past weekend, in response to last month's school shooting in Florida, hundreds of thousands of students held rallies across the country calling for gun control. The march in Washington was the centerpiece of those rallies. In Congress, members are pushing reforms that would beef up school security. And President Donald Trump favors training school personnel to carry concealed weapons. So where does Louisiana stand in this national debate? What increased security measures can schools take and how much do they cost? What mental health services are available to prevent students from violently acting out? And what legislation is being considered at our state capitol to address the threat of school shootings? Tonight, Louisiana Public Square looks for answers to these questions and more on making schools safe. If you're one of the 23,000 students attending public school in Bossier Parish, having an armed sheriff on campus is a way of life. These deputies are employed as the school resource officer, or SRO, for the school. Every grade level is uh, protected. Elementary, middle, and high school is protected through the uh, school resource officer program. That's a total of 34 schools, according to Bossier Parish Superintendent Scott Smith. The program started 25 years ago in the parish's largest high school. It came to the forefront in 2012, shortly after Bossier Parish Sheriff Julian Whittington's election. Uh, not too long after that, the Sandy Hook event happened, and I got with Superintendent Smith and the school board, and we all agreed we needed to do more. And they committed to funding, uh, the, uh, the cost of the operation, we provide the deputies, the training, the units, the whole thing, and the school board uh, financially supports it. Voters in the parish approved a bond initiative, which increased their property taxes to pay for the program. The overall program cost around $3.6 million for these 38 officers. Uh, about half of that comes from our general funding, and the other half comes from that a uh, bond referendum for a total of about $3.6 million. The only other district-wide use of SROs is in Rapides Parish. Its multi-million dollar program is funded by a voter-approved half-cent sales tax. While critics question their cost and effectiveness, SROs have averted dozens of threats in Bossier Parish. Lieutenant Adam Johnson, director of school safety, says building relationships with students is the key. These students will tell the SRO something that they won't even tell their parents, they won't tell um, their, their other mentors, which would be their teachers, their coaches, stuff like that. So it's a, it's a very, very big tool for us as law enforcement and to, to help protect these children every day is to have those relationships. They come and tell us things such as a possible weapon being on campus or things that they know that would hurt their student environment. The school officers carry the same equipment as patrolmen and receive annual school threat training. In addition to being a deterrent, their presence also has an indirect influence on school discipline, Smith says. My last year as an assistant principal, we received a school resource officer at our high school, and I just remember how it, it just brought down, it, it brought safety level, uh, safety level way up uh, uh, to a very high, high point, but it also, the fights between students also went down to almost zero. In addition to school officers, schools across Louisiana are considering additional safety tactics, including reducing entry points, metal detectors, and security cameras. The Louisiana School Boards Association recently asked the legislature for $70 million for increased security measures. What we really want to do is to decrease the barriers to learning for all of the students in our schools, whether that be an academic barrier, a behavioral barrier, social, emotional, mental health. 
Dr. Megan Medley is a nationally certified school psychologist who teaches at Nichols. School psychologists and counselors can act as the first line of defense against students with violent tendencies. We want to look at what's going on in the child's life, what's going on at school, what the dynamics of school is with the child, what's going on in the community with them. We also want to look at, do they have a plan? Do they have the means to, to actually carry out that plan? And do they have intent to harm others? Student and faculty can refer troubled classmates to a school psychologist who will then conduct a threat assessment with a crisis team. Our aim with a threat assessment is to prevent violence, and so it can be violence to the student themselves. So we also often include a suicide kind of assessment. We want to look at that as well as the possibility of harming others. The National Association of School Psychologists recommends one psychologist for every 500 students. In Louisiana, the ratio is one per every 2,400 students. There's also a shortage of new applicants. There is a critical shortage of school psychologists having those 58 different positions open right now and potentially more in the near future. We want to make sure that we can attract people from outside, creating good internships so that people stay in the state and continue on is really helpful. Medley says the Department of Education is considering cutting funding to the state's largest school psychologist internship program. Among the bills being considered this session to address school shootings are efforts to ban the sale of assault rifles, let students wear bulletproof backpacks, and allow teachers and school personnel to carry firearms, something Sheriff Whittington is not sold on. Train professional law enforcement qualify, certify with weapons two or three times a year. In a real life shooting situation, when the bullets are coming back at you, their proficiency drops to 20%. So now if you start out with a, a teacher, where are you going to end up? No matter what legislation is passed to help prevent the threat of gun violence in schools, Whittington says inaction is not an option. You can either hide your head in the sand and pretend like it's not there, or you can address it. And here in Bossier, the school board and the sheriff's office and the citizens are willing to support it uh, through their tax money to have the best and do the best that we can do. And, you know, hiding your head in the sand, hoping it doesn't happen, it's not a plan. Joining us now to discuss some plans is our studio audience. Now, we've got high school students from the Legislative Youth Advisory Council, representatives from the Louisiana School Boards Association, educators, school psychologists, and a counselor. We also have ex-law enforcement officers who provide weapons training, and we want to welcome everyone. Numerous national surveys have been conducted following the Broward County shooting. A Gallup poll of teachers found their top three answers for preventing gun violence in schools were stricter gun laws, mentioned by 33 percent, a ban on assault weapons favored by 22 percent and better funding for mental health services that was suggested by 20 percent. A USA Today poll of middle and high school students found that 70 percent support requiring armed police officers on campus, 60 percent favor metal detectors at entrances, 47 percent oppose arming teachers. And finally, a Pew Research poll from 2017 found that more than half of adults, 55 percent, oppose school personnel carrying guns. 89 percent support prohibiting people with mental illnesses from buying guns. And 84 percent favor background checks for the private sale of guns as well as at gun shows. So let's start there. How would you address the issue of making schools safe? Let me begin with Greg Ferris. Well, the SRO program is excellent, probably the best as far as the active response, um, Andre. It's expensive. We do it in East Feliciana Parish. We don't have full coverage. We do it in the high schools, which are generally more dangerous than the elementary schools because you don't have 10, 11, 12-year-olds um, committing these sorts of things. Hardening up schools as far as the construction of them, the architecture of them, that's a future thing because those schools are not going to be built next week. Passive systems um, will decrease the possibility of having an armed encounter for sure. But if you have one, if you have a situation such as you had in Parkland a few weeks ago, such as you had in Sandy Hook and others, the only effective response to an armed intruder is a trained and armed response whether that's a police officer, whether that is, is someone else, school personnel, 
But armed and trained is the only effective way to deal with that once they get past, past the barriers. You have an extensive history, your entire career in law enforcement. That comes from your perspective. Let me ask someone in the teaching community, Anita, any thoughts? I am opposed to teachers being armed to carry weapons. And I am opposed because we already have enough African-American males who are innocently killed. How can we be assured, reassured that that number will not increase? Let's hear from a student, Elise, from Lafayette High. Hi. Well, I think that the debate is so focused on, on making schools safer right now that it kind of ignores how much of a larger problem that this is in our country. And, and that it doesn't only happen in schools and that students feeling unsafe is not a phenomenon that only occurs at school. It can occur in large public places, in crowded areas, and it, generally just, just the phenomenon of young people growing up in an environment where they feel unsafe in general because of the events that are happening around them. Okay. How about Dr. Janet Pope from Louisiana Schools? Uh, you came with a question tonight and thoughts. Tell us about that. Um, basically, um, we're looking at what type of funding that was out there to assist school systems in, in, in safety within their schools. Um, I know um, and Mr. Falk could probably talk more about that on the national level. Some things have just passed in Congress um, as far as uh, probably grant funding that would come back down like to the State Department. So we're kind of looking at that as future funding to assist school systems to be able to help with doing metal detectors or maybe um, hiring more SRO officers within their schools. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, with us tonight, an LSU student, not in high school, not an educator, but she's actually taken off from spring break to be with us. Angel, uh, your thoughts? Um, I think my biggest concern about the whole debate is about arming teachers. And my pause about it is that if you arm the teachers, how can you guarantee that students won't have access, the students who may need help, and um, how do you prevent them from having access to the guns that the teachers have on campus now? And also, if the guns are properly um, put away and locked up, what is the response time going to be if an sh active shooting does occur? Okay, thank you very much. Brandon, your thoughts as you come in here? to talk to us? Uh, to this young lady's point, um, those are definitely valid concerns. Um, it goes back to Ms. Ferris's point of, of training. Um, everything that she mentioned can be addressed through training um, and, and of course equipment. Um, I think we have to get around, uh, get our mind around the fact that we cannot prevent school shootings. At the point that someone makes a decision to do that, all you can do is not create school shooters and then be ready to respond to it. Uh, be it guns, knives, sticks, rocks, bad words, you're not going to stop somebody that is determined to do something um, once they get to that point. Um, there's definitely some physical security hardening techniques that we can utilize, but I do think the problem goes a lot further back to that, its origin. Um, I think it's societal. I think there's definitely some mental, mental health issues to be addressed. Um, but once we're to the point that we're talking about guns and bulletproof this and that, we, we're, we're beyond the nexus. Now we're, we're actually addressing symptoms, not actual problems. All right, let me hear from a, a student now. Um, Chad, you're at Lafayette High. You're at a school that uh, uh, practices active shooter drills and has, have been prepped for that sort of thing. In fact, um, Columbine, I believe, uh, happened after you even came along. So you grew up with this sort of scenario. Your thoughts on this? Like the earliest memory I can think of a school shooting was uh, in middle school after Sandy Hook. And it was at Paul Rowe, Elise was there, and we had a lockdown that day. And ever since then, I've been growing up unsure, not only at school, but everywhere else, of my personal safety and the people around me. And I don't think adding guns, in my personal opinion, was going to stop the problem. Like Elise said, I think this problem is more broad in scope, because I feel like the gun is just an outlet for people to address their uh, own personal issues and they could take it out on innocent bystanders. And what's stopping a teacher or anyone else from having a bad day with a gun? Because it seems like a lot of these shooters, people know them as normal people, and they have a problem or like a bad incident, and they flip a switch and they shoot up a school. And that's scary. We don't need to inject more guns into a system that's already flooded with weapons of mass destruction. All right, Chad, thank you. From the Louisiana School uh, Psychological Association, Brandon, your thoughts on this? 
Well, I think that um, the the issue is very multifaceted, and there are um, you know a lot of things that have been eroded from our, um, our our mental health systems in terms of support, both within the school and outside of school. And so we need to look at ways to kind of build up some of those supports for uh, for students and for uh, for adults in the community, so that they have places to go uh, before it gets to the level of a shooting. Dr. Carmen Broussard, also uh, in the same genre of work. Correct. Um, our schools are under-supported in terms of mental health professionals. Um, that's a funding issue. It's an availability issue due to critical shortage. Um, that definitely needs to be addressed in terms of trying to meet not just the state standards and the ratio of how many professionals we should have per student, but perhaps the best practice standards, which are far lower. Um, I'm also concerned about um, all of the adults on campus being prepared to uh, identify and address risk. And so we start our school years with individuals um, t in, the, in the teaching um, role receiving information about how to uh, recognize risk and address risk, but other adults on campus may not support personnel, building cleaners, lunchroom workers, um, and so on, and then it doesn't even take into account all of the long-term substitutes that come into our buildings who may not have that knowledge, may not have that um, ability to recognize problems when they occur. Let me ask uh, Mr. Falk, uh, long-time superintendent in, in terms of looking after and looking over schools, your thoughts on this issue? Mr. Ferries mentioned it, put it very well, that having a trained resource officer is a great deterrent. The setup of the schools right now is different all across this state. Mm -hmm. You you have rural communities and and people don't realize that trained law enforcement professionals, they come into a building if there's an incident with an active shooter, they are trained to drop that person. That's their first priority. And uh, we have crisis intervention plans, crisis plans at every school. We conduct drills. Uh, I know when I was in Central, we met with the Sheriff's Department, with our principals on a regular basis. We reviewed our plans. We saw some weaknesses. We got uh, video cameras to where now we, we have it outside and inside the building. You also have access now that you can connect with the local law enforcement agencies to where they can also monitor the exterior of a building and see. And then you need to identify your building so that when the law enforcement comes on that campus, they know where to go and they're not wandering all over because time is of the essence. Cindy, you're a teacher. I see you nodding yes. during this. Mm -hmm. Let's hear from you. The problems seem to be overwhelming. Um, we're at an elementary school that seems like it's very safe and we're back in a, in a wonderful uh, neighborhood. Anita School was on lockdown today, um, awaiting the, the information about the Alton Sterling situation. I was not on lockdown. We enjoyed all of our regular activities, no threats of anything or anybody. I worry though about our bus drivers and, and people that have children off campus. I worry about coaches and football players in the early morning or the late evenings. Anything could happen at any time. Um, I worry about I worry about me being on duty at lunch recess. I worry about the teachers and the students that are in in portable buildings or out buildings. You know, you've got your main building, and maybe you can make plenty of of safety concerns there. But what do you do with those trailer houses and those portable buildings? They're even up off the ground. Somebody could throw something up under those and and then it's all over. I don't think that we can anticipate every problem or every situation. Okay. And time is of the essence. Yeah, I, I agree. We didn't get to everybody yet, mm -hmm. but we get, definitely will because we're not done yet. This is all uh, the time we have for this portion of our show, but when we return, we're going to be joined by a panel of experts to further explore securing Louisiana schools. Welcome back everyone to Louisiana Public Square. Tonight we're discussing making schools safe. Joining us right now is our panel of experts, 
Jason Ard was elected sheriff of Livingston Parish in 2011. He has over 20 years of law enforcement experience and is the only sheriff in the state who is a current certified firearms instructor. Also with us, Dr. Betty Muller. She's a child and adolescent psychiatrist who teaches at Tulane University's School of Medicine. She has been a psychiatric consultant in schools in Lafouche and Orleans parishes. Republican Neil Reiser is with us, a state senator from Columbia. This session, he is sponsoring legislation which would allow active duty or retired police and military with concealed carry permits to provide school security. Also, Scott Richard with us tonight. He has been executive director of the Louisiana School Boards Association since the year 2012. He has experience as a classroom teacher and administrator with the Louisiana Department of Education. Now, before we go to our audience questions, of which we have several still to go to, could each of you briefly tell us uh, a little bit from your perspective, how real is the threat of school shootings in our state? Jason, I'll just start with you. Uh, well. I mean, us in law enforcement, we, we don't really train for the what if things, it's, it's when something happens. So um, we have to take every threat from, no matter if it's a school shooting or, or armed robbery. So uh, we think all that we train for when it's gonna happen. Uh, so I think there is a threat and we have to train for that. Okay, Dr. Muller. As a child and adolescent psychiatrist, it's unfortunate that I do face the issue of the greater um, underscoring issue of violence in our society and I have to agree with several of the audience members who said that school shootings are symptomatic of the violence in our society that children and adolescents as well as adults are encountering violence in particularly their homes where they should be the most safe um, and we are spilling out that violence from our homes into the neighborhoods, into the streets, and into community settings such as schools. Uh, so I do think that this is a problem that starts in the family and then spreads, unfortunately, into the rest of the community. Mr. Reiser? The, the fact that we're even here tonight having the discussion lets you know that it is, it is clear and that the presence, the danger is against both we have now, these are domestic enemies. They're enemies of the state. And we've seen on 9-11, we've seen other threats of foreign enemies. So the, the reason when we've, we've had this discussion, uh, to do nothing is not an option. Uh, we've seen that gun-free zones, that that has been words, and words is just not getting it done. These individuals mean the bodily harm and want to cause death, and we're here tonight, they're talking about in our school system. And the, the fact, I'm open to the discussion. How do, be, how do we best do this? How do we work together to secure that? All right, Mr. Richard. Thank you, Andre, and thank you to LPB for raising the level of awareness by having this program. It's a serious threat to every school system and every school, every community. Even though we know many of the copycat instances that have occurred since the uh, tragedy in Florida uh, are copycats, every one of those threats has to be taken seriously. Mm -hmm. It disrupts the learning environment, it puts everyone in harm's way, and it's just a total disruption to the school day when these instances occur. And, and everything needs to be taken really seriously uh, because the safety of our, children, of our children in Louisiana has to be a priority before we even get to square one, which is uh, high quality learning. Uh, Reed, uh, you're also from Lafayette, Turlings High. And first of all, I want to talk about uh, you as a high school student, um, plugged into social media, plugged into the marches, the awareness. Talk about how the student's voice has been different after this incident in Florida. Well, even though I might disagree with many of the students and what they're saying, I do appreciate how their voices are being heard and how they're taking seriously because it's opening up a dialogue now where if these students are taken seriously and these young people are taken seriously that I might be taken seriously in the same way and it would open up a better dialogue where we can find solutions that are not just outside of the adults but people that are in high schools now and who are experiencing these. Marion, you are uh, with us this evening. Do you have a question for the panel or you have a comment that you wanted to say? Yes. Um Actually, like whenever I start thinking about like school safety, I just wonder why we only focus on 
like school shootings. Like since we're going ahead and we're focusing and making this such a priority for safety in our schools, why don't we go ahead and make, uh, you know, safety in all circumstances? Because often, you know, like if one avenue is cut off for uh, a criminal to commit a crime, then they often reach another. Like why don't we just go ahead and put in place like metal detectors and things like that, why isn't our priority to only stop gun, you know, like shootings? Why don't we go ahead and prioritize all safety issues? I couldn't agree with you more. And I think as everyone talks about the safety of our children, it seems, and it is in the school right now because it gets highlighted when these awful massacres occur by a student to other students and teachers. But it's, it's perme it permeates our society. We, can, we do tend to be reactive in our society and we put money and resources where there was a sudden big highlighted issue as opposed to the continued trying to support families and children in their everyday lives um, and making sure that they have the resources to be safe and to ensure safety to their children. Uh, it, it, children are going to school, and I said this many years ago in the Orleans Parish School Systems to the teachers, you have to understand that you're teaching damaged children, that many of these children are coming in not equipped to learn, much less deal with their peers and other authority figures. And so the one big buzzword that's going in our society now that I think the schools need to adopt is trauma-informed environments, that you interact with every individual as if they have been exposed to trauma and have been traumatized because then you're able to give them a lot more flexibility in how you're interacting with them. You're not going to be confrontational in the way that we tend to be confrontational. You still will maintain your authority but in an understanding empathetic way yes. and I think that's what we need to start emphasizing across the board it's, it, we, uh, we have to take it very multi-pronged. We still have to secure the schools physically. Um, we'll have to have quick response times when the awful things occur. But on a day-to-day, minute-by-minute basis, we can be armed with a lot more interpersonal and, 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 and focused skills and how we deal with one another. Scott Richard, let me ask you, you've been an educator, you've been a teacher in the classroom, an administrator. What are the schools doing? What can they do in your estimation? Well, after Sandy Hook, the legislature and stakeholders and the school communities uh, took it upon themselves to create a more formalized system of crisis intervention plans. Every school site is required to have a crisis intervention plan that is coordinated with law enforcement at the local level. Drills are required, several steps are included in the mandated crisis intervention plans. But that's more of a reactionary uh, way of, of dealing with the issues. Uh, every teacher, every administrator, every school board member, every superintendent in a school system yearns to have more counselors on their campus, more mental health support, more of a focus on intervention at the school level, especially at younger ages. That entails funding. Therein lies the problem. We can't have this conversation without an honest discussion in regards to funding and best practices with a, a milieu of services to try to reach our youngest students to prevent these things from happening uh, at the school level. And the final piece is it's bigger than school system personnel addressing this issue. I think you've heard that resonate tonight throughout the discussion. It takes all stakeholders in the community working together. And uh, we're, we're thankful for law enforcement, but it's bigger than law enforcement. We're, we need mental health, law enforcement, education, churches, the entire community working together to try to address the issues that we deal with in today's society. Everybody needs to be on board across yes, the board, I, it would sound like. Uh, yeah. Senator Reiser? Uh, you mentioned earlier, I was watching the show, we were talking about legislation that I had. Uh, and that was in judiciary see yesterday that that bill failed now a lot of discussion during the bill they kept referring to teachers the bill did not have teachers in it uh, active duty military reservist uh, and reserve and retired police personnel and we went through I feel like that we, knowing nothing is not the answer and we have a lot of poorer parishes 
that we don't have the resources. Where I'm, I have 10 rural parishes. We don't have the resources, so it is an opportunity. Uh, there's probably other objects, uh, instruments out there, but the effort is to have something. To have nothing there, I feel like that is just not, it's not an answer for me. When we have our children being presented and our teachers being presented with deadly force, you, you have to have de deadly force present. A good talking to is just not going to get it done. You know, please don't do that. It's not going to happen. You know, and we've seen that a sign that says, please don't bring a weapon on campus. That's law-abiding citizens recognize that. But I'm, I'm here with everyone else. How, how are we going to resolve this? I mean, we, we have to talk about it. And I'm glad we're here tonight. And it's unfortunate these individuals, and a deadly force can be anything. Somebody can pick up anything, and we was talking about just now, and it, yes, and it's student on student violence. And there's teachers that, that will try to intervene in that. Some of it's been so legislatively, we use the word handcuff, where they can't intervene, and teachers get, get, get hurt. So there, there's a lot of topics in this, but it's kind of an overview. And, and, our, and our topic tonight is what can we do to make schools safe? They're, yes, not, sir. Sa they're not safe. Yes, sir, and we're all, uh, I think we, we all have the same consensus on that. How are we getting there? I want to hear from Kay. We haven't talked to you yet. A question, comment uh, um, for our panel? I'm always curious every time something like this happens, and it's still mass shootings are considered rare compared to other crimes. The instantaneous jump, the media will focus on it all the time. They don't focus on when people save their lives with guns. You don't hear about those. It's a problem. Even mass shootings are a problem. We need to fix the problem. And you're not going to fix the problem by blaming the tool, because it's a tool. And actually, violent crime has been steadily decreasing. And you have, so people want to ban guns. Well, DOJ sponsored a study on the 94 gun ban back in 97 and in 2004. It didn't have a significant effect on crime at all. Yet the CDC comes up in their 2013 study. There's a significant amount of defensive gun use. Those people are never acknowledged. What happened in Parkland was a catastrophic enforcement failure. I would like to know, there were so many misses on that. How do we prevent those misses? You had the FBI dropping the ball. You had people reporting, hey, he's showing the, the signs. And it was yeah. all the way back from 10,011. We have law enforcement here who right. I think can address that. Jason Ard, <laughs> tough question. How do we get to the root of yeah. the problem yeah. instead of well, I think everybody to. makes valid points here, and, and I can't answer anything for the FBI. I'm, I'm not going to go that route, but I can tell you um, that, yes, I think that we sometimes as a society, we want to focus on things of what you're talking about with, with guns and, and look, I can I can take a, a 22 rifle and do just as much damage as AR-15. It's, it's it's the same concept here, and that is not what we need to be focused on. If you take guns and do better gun control, I can still get my hands on a gun if I want to. Criminals look for opportunity, okay, and opportunity is going to be there. So we need to focus more on the mental health, and a lot of people don't want to talk about that because that costs money. We need to look at that. That is a, a big problem here. And so I, I do not think that uh, arming our teachers is the answer. They didn't sign up for that. I have a daughter that's a junior in high school. Um, she told me already, I, Daddy, I don't want my teacher to have a gun. <laughs> and, uh, and, and it was many reasons, but I want my, my child to get an education. I want my teachers to focus on that. And I know all educators are going to do the best job they can to protect my kid in any way they can anyway, whether they have a, a, a gun or not. But that is not the answer. The answer is just what you're talking about. We, we, we seem to focus on um, all these other things and we're not focusing on taking care of these kids from an early age and, and starting and getting these SROs is what my belief is. Get them in the school at a young age. Let them have a rapport with our, with our law enforcement and make sure we understand um, what their, their challenges are. Because, it, you know, we have bullying in school. We have victims in school at young ages. And I think we can prevent a lot of that and working with our school system, working with our counselors. Uh, but again, we don't need to be focusing on things like um, if I take this AR-15 off the street, is this going to stop uh, this violence? No, it's not. Um, it, it, you, you can't stop it. I think the, to me, the mental health and making sure you have a, a, a armed police officer there ready that is trained to react and do the best job he can because that's not 100%. 
Yeah. That's not 100% that he's going to stop everything. And, uh, and we're not in there. I don't want my, my deputies in a school to be there as a, as a prison guard. I don't want them in that school being interactive with our kids and, and being mentors to our kids. And if something happens, then they are trained to address that and help to save our kids' lives and prevent the loss of lives. We want to prevent it. We don't want it to happen. Well, I have one more question to the educators. Do you feel that zero tolerance policies or, or video games, you know, the violence that have been exposed to, I, I feel like as parents, we're not parenting. Like they're babying, being babysat by technology now. The issue of video games has been researched repeatedly and the bottom line with video games <laughs> is violent video games are not good for kids who tend to have poor frustration tolerance aggressive tendencies and anger outbursts. Um, that the average kid usually will handle violent video games just as any other thing that they will do in their lives. Um, conflict resolution is a huge issue and frustration tolerance is a huge issue. Um, you're right, our families are failing horribly in teaching very young children, you will get angry and I can say no and you can go off and be upset with me and then we can come back and we will resolve this. It's, it's catering, it's placating, it's I don't want them to look bad in public, I don't want to look like a bad parent because my child's crying or angry. Um, that's part of life, failure is a part of life. And you know, resilience develops out of failure. Learning coping skills results because you fail. And we as a society don't let our kids fail. Uh, we don't want them to fail. <laughs> And, <laughs> you know, as a parent, you think, mm, you know, should I? But yes, you know, the, you have to let them stand on their own two feet. Yes. You guide them, you support them, yes. but you allow things to happen. And then you come back and work out what's the resolution if it's not a good outcome. And I have to emphasize the SRO officers are a great idea, but they have to be very carefully picked because they have to be two things at one time. They have to be an authority figure and a deterrent right. as well as a facilitator. And having good interpersonal skills with these kids, respecting these children, and showing that they can do both. Mr. Richard? I'll, I'll go back to my earlier comments. Uh, obviously every teacher, every educator knows that first learning occurs at home with every child. And I think we have to take a hard look uh, at where we are, how we've evolved as a society. Social media, instant gratification is prevalent and our teachers need the ability to work with parenting and uh, parenting skills uh, with parents across our state and across America. It, it's part of the problem and it goes back to making sure the entire community addresses the issues we're talking about tonight. Schools can't do it alone teachers can't do it alone. It takes a group effort and um, I think that that hopefully answers your question. I'm sure I'm you knew the answer to that already. I'm yeah. kind of curious about that. May I add something as a pre-K teacher? Um, today we did a drill again. We've been doing drills of our code word and <coughs> our four-year-olds are following a pathway of that we have established for their safety. But I want to add something that is a solution that is working on campuses, and it's called restorative justice, where it does exactly what you're saying. We get in a circle at our, uh, at our school, my babies, four, get in a circle. I want to, we get a subject, and we t discuss, hey, what happened this weekend? When the flood happened, we didn't go back to school as normal. Those babies sat in a circle. I shared my experiences of walking through water. They shared their experiences. So when that child who was threatened and felt so insecure, I already knew that day, that week, how to react because I listened. I took the time to establish a restorative circle that says you, I care about you, not only in school, but outside of school. I care what happens to you. And because I care, I've made a commitment to be that mother while you're here. And your, that mothering includes your health, your mental health. 
So those are things that I know are working in schools. You're at East Baton Rouge Parish, uh, pre-K teacher. Yes, I am. Who could deserve a huge round of applause right now, <laughs> yes. I think. Yeah, go right now. I want to hear from Susan uh, East Nelson, Louisiana Partnership for Children and Families. Uh, been waiting to hear from you tonight, sure. so let's let's hear it. Uh, you know, I think we're talking a lot about school and making school safer, but we know some things about the Parkland shooter that he had a pretty traumatic early childhood. And one of the things we need to focus on, and we, and we are starting to here in Louisiana, is that early childhood, that zero to three. We know that that brain development happens from zero to three a lot, a lot more than they'll ever get later on in their lives. And that's where things like empathy are learned. And people don't realize that that interaction with infants and that holding and that contact is what later on gives them empathy down the road that keeps them from doing these things. So I'm really proud that the legislature is focusing on having a statewide commission um, looking at these early interventions, looking at these early things that we can do at zero um, that that keeps these children from becoming the type of student who does these things. Senator, this is also the, the state that stopped the ECSS programs, mm -hmm. which was early childhood mm -hmm. supports and services, which directly intervened for the zero to three population. I, I so we're, we're how the about the, gonna be the legislature? Will we? But our legislature talks out of now? both sides of its mouth sometimes. Okay, well, how, how are they talking right now, Senator? <laughs> <laughs> Since you're there. Right. And you can put me on the spot as a psychiatrist. I want to first come in, Anita, what she said. And, and there's a phrase is that listening is not waiting your turn to talk. The legislature is listening. And everything comes back down to money. When you talk about, and I get confused, it's easier for me to say they've got a security guard than whatever the other term is, is more relevant to me. Yes. I guess to me, that's more of a force. But yes, when you're talking about a child's personality is normally developed by two years old, we have to de develop, we have to handle that. But right now, though, we have those that's already and this age that we have to deal with, that we know are, are threatening us. So once again, uh, we, all, we are listening, and I'm, I'm here tonight listening, and we want, we have to work on this thing together. Yes. How are we going to do it? Current, clear, and present dangers that we're having. The world's going to change dramatically with technology in the next 10 years, probably beyond what we ever dreamed it's been so far. So these things are going to be adaptive all the way through. Law enforcement is dealing with situations now, clearly, that you listen to on the news. And I really, it really disturbs me that when these individuals commit these hideous crimes, these murders, these, they're cowards, these cowardly acts, that the national media picks it up and just runs it over and over and over. All day long, they're running it. I, and I can add, and I, and I might defer to right here is, does that have an impact? Does, does that seem to reflect? Does, do they want to be copycats or not? I mean, because that's, to me, that, the, the, is that, that their one moment fame if they're wanting something or the cycle? Well, unfortunately, impact? copycats are very much that. I mean, mm -hmm. that these are empty, lonely, um, ill-defined individuals <coughs> who don't have much in their lives. And this may be their claim mm -hmm. to fame um, in the very infamous manner. Uh, it, it is a shame that many of our people and in, in children are lonely, are sad, mm -hmm. are uh, not able to develop interpersonal relationships. Not only have they had difficulty developing empathy, but they've had difficulty with people respecting them mm -hmm. as individuals and listening to them as individuals. Mm -hmm. When in my practice, when I see kids, the first thing I do is I talk to them. And their parents struggle with that. I mean, they want to answer the questions. They want to supply the information. And I'll tell the parents, you'll get your turn. I absolutely mm -hmm. value what you have to say. But your child is the one in the office because they're having difficulties. <coughs> and I try very hard to have that child take ownership of whatever's going on in their lives because it is about them. They have to take ownership. And in our society, we don't take ownership anymore. If you do something wrong, what's one of the first things you're taught? Don't say anything. Well, I think we have to look at where we are <laughs> as a society. We, we're touching on a lot of good issues mm -hmm. about the individual child, but it is my hope, representing school boards, that we don't just talk about it because of what happened in Florida, and that we take a hard look and continue the dialogue and, and have a more comprehensive plan, a strategic plan to address these issues. And we have to look at where people congregate. Have you been on airport lately? Have you been to the Capitol lately? Violence has uh, decreased in those particular locales because of the common sense measures that have been put in place over time 
and now we need to have that discussion about schools and the safety of our children, but also maintaining a balance to not make our schools look like prisons and have a good balance with some common sense things we can do uh, in regards to safety and, and do all the other things we've mentioned tonight is focusing on that individual child, one child at a time. Hopefully that's the message that comes out of tonight. You know, and interestingly enough, what you were talking about the airports and communities. You know, cameras are an interesting thing. Um, video cameras certainly can invade privacy, but they also make you take ownership because you can't hide from the video camera. Um, and it's an interesting parallel um, in what we're having to do, again, within families. I mean, families have got to allow their children to develop as individuals, but they also have to hold them accountable for decisions they're making and for how they're interacting with others. We have a parent <laughs> and a child in our audience tonight, Alice Basden. Your daughter is Alix from Lafayette. Right. I would like to hear from your perspective as a parent, so much of what we've heard tonight has been starting with the core of the family has broken down. So I'd like to hear from you and I'd also like to hear from Alix on this topic and on the broader topic of the voice of students you could even throw in parenting skills if you want. <laughs> okay. Well, gosh, all of these things that have been mentioned, of course, my head is just really spinning on this, but I, I will say that our family has not broken down and it's intact, <laughs> and then we'll hear from my leaks. But, um, you know, I think that what occurs to me most, Andre, is that the march on Washington that these kids did, I think that's related to the fact that these things happen, you know, every once in a while there's a massacre of children or there's a massacre at a public place and we have the same discussion. We talk about how we're going to fix mental health, which I'm not sure what that means, but that's a that's a common thing people say. And then they say, "Okay, so we need to um, w we need to really uh, put resources toward, you know, security in schools." And we have all of these discussions like we are now and we go through all of the different options and I think the reason these kids say they're not stopping is because nothing ever pans out that actually addresses it. We say some schools maybe get a resource, but I'd like to challenge the legislature to have an actual plan, not just you, Senator Rice. I'm, I'm <laughs> to have an actual plan. And if it involves, I think what it is is they're impatient. It's like, okay, banning assault rifles might not be the answer, but they want something done now. We didn't get here like, overnight and we're not going to get out of it overnight. Right. But. If you need to do that right now, but while you fix mental health, they want you to take measures now while you're working on these things that sound like they're going to take lots of money that people aren't going to want to spend, plus uh, mental health, fixing mental health. I think that's something that I'm not even really understand what they mean, but I just feel like it's too multifaceted. At least is that why we're hearing the outcry that we've heard? I uh, think so. I think that... Um, like I said earlier, my generation is exceptional in having grown up under the sort of in the shadow of events such as these. It It is not for me something new. It is something that has existed my whole life. So for people who are my age to say we need something to happen in the way that will stop horrible and heinous attacks such as these, it is because we are at our absolute limit with having this be the way of life. And that's, that's the m basis of, of, I think, the student activism that is occurring today. One of the big thrusts of this activism has been uh, the ability to purchase guns if you have a men mental health background or issue. Sheriff Ard, what, what, what in that area can we do and, and, and not wait around and do it talk about it and talk about it and really not do anything. What can be done? What's being done now with that? Well, how, how easy it, is it, it for, for it, that it, in Louisiana? It's too easy. Okay. And, uh, and that's, that's been an issue and it, and it came up and we've actually had to deal with cases uh, with people uh, we know have mental health issues that can still go purchase a gun and there's no mechanism in place to, to stop that. And so it should be. And, and I, I don't know what the answer is, but it needs to be an answer. And uh, so we in law enforcement deal with that sometimes where uh, we have information. We know that we've had to uh, do a, a corners pick up on someone because they have made threats. Uh, they have planned out certain things. They get evaluated and three days later they're back on the street. And nothing's gonna keep them from going and getting a gun. How do they so get entered into the, a database? 
for example? Well, or, are, are they being entered? Correct. Um, I don't know if they may be, be entered into a database, but um, some law enforcement, we share information and we can do those things, but there's nothing in there that prevents them from, from purchasing a firearm. It's a family uh, issue. It's, it's, it is. <coughs> I, own, and, I own a gun store. I mean, I sell guns. Um, other than someone walking in acting crazy, I don't know their mental health right. situation. There is no database. There shouldn't be a database. <coughs> there's HIPAA issues. There's, there's other right. issues. Who defines when you're at that line? But I have had instances Well, I think there could be a definition, though, right? Well, but most gun right? violence, and I said this the last time I, I mean, was here, and it's not a popular stance, we're talking but about most gun issues. violence are not done by the mentally ill. They're done by regular citizens. Right. Um, and I do know that the mentally ill may have more of an issue at times of poor impulse control, poor judgment, but the huge majority of crime right. by firearms are done by your average citizens, supposedly. Um, so I, I, I don't disagree that we need to have more checks and balances when it comes to buying firearms. I don't know, and I agree with you, HIPAA is a huge issue. I think mm -hmm. uh, violating people's rights is a big issue in this country. Uh, Would we you do argue protect that a person who wakes up and goes to a school and kills a bunch of people, by that act alone has demonstrated some aspect of a mental health issue? But that person didn't wake up and just decide to go and shoot right, that but, morning. But is that act not a manifestation of some kind, diagnosed or otherwise, mental health issue? I think anyone who shoots anyone has a mental health issue. Mm -hmm. So if a police Quite officer, if a police I mean officer shoots someone raping someone, that officer has a mental health issue? Well, okay. So if someone is violently acting, not in self-defense or in the protection of someone else's life, yes, I think that is a mental health issue. Would you I talk about, I'm sorry, talk about HIPAA for a moment to explain That's why that is something that is, is important and, and pervades all of our areas of life? Well, HIPAA it, uh, it, uh, pertains to all health information, not just right. mental health, but right. physical health. And it is our right to privacy. Of, of any issues regarding our health um, and that it cannot be shared willy-nilly out in the public, that there are very clear protective factors in how data is transmitted, to whom it's transmitted, and how it is stored. Um, and so having a database of those individuals with mental health issues is a huge HIPAA violation um, unless they are committing felonies. And then you have your own database that right. they have already in that process get into where HIPAA is not as involved in that. It, and it's not because of their mental health, they actually did a violent crime that they're getting into a database. Okay, let me do this now, um, audience. Uh, as you listen, everybody's been fantastic. I want to get a closing comment from each of our panelists tonight on what you've heard, your thoughts going forward, and making something happen to make our schools safe. Well, I, I think we've heard a lot of good things. Everybody makes good points. Uh, I think it's our job, it's my job as a sheriff, is to go back to my individual uh, parish and, and, and try to sit down with the school, uh, school system. And I think that uh, we, we all lack in communication. I think that we need <coughs> a better communication. I think we need to take these ideas and we need to actually put these ideas uh, and move, take these ideas and actually move forward with them. Um, I, I'm, again, I have a training background. Um, I don't think that uh, uh, arming teachers or arming uh, people that are not uh, law enforcement trained professionals, uh, I don't believe that is the answer. I think that is creating more problems uh, for law enforcement when it comes to that. And so uh, I think, again, uh, from my perspective, what, what I think needs to happen is, again, taking these ideas, moving forward with them, and let's stop talking about it and let's make things happen. And uh, so uh, I, I don't think the answer is going to be uh, stricter uh, gun laws. Uh, I don't think that's going to stop from this thing happening. You're, you're very correct. Uh, criminals are what we deal with every day. It's not necessarily just mental health, but we do need to have some things in place to help law enforcement to keep these mental health individuals from coming in and purchasing a firearm. If we know and we have information, but there's nothing in place to help us to stop that. All right. Uh, so. Those are the things that needs to happen. Sheriff Jason Art from uh, Livingston Parish. Dr. Muller, mm -hmm. final thoughts? Yes, I think that does need to be a multifaceted solution, but I think it needs to be focused. I think there have to be very clear parameters on what steps we're taking in the different areas in which we want to address. And I, and I do believe that we have to support mental health efforts, and mental health being good mental health, not just for the ill, 
um, but just in how we're rearing our children, the atmosphere in which we as individuals are functioning and how we handle our interpersonal relationships, and the huge issue of conflict resolution. It's a huge issue that we have somehow forgotten that you can be angry, you can be upset with one another, and yet you can come back together and resolve those differences and still be okay. That's something that Senator Reiser deals with in the legislature on a daily <laughs> basis. <laughs> on a daily basis. <laughs> right? yeah. But do we come back together? Yeah. Some, fi <laughs> some final thoughts from you, sir. We're talking about the violence and deadly threats. So I'm gonna simply get it down. We, we have two, our first and second amendment, and I'm gonna be specific. We're here tonight exercising our freedom of speech. And we have a constitutional right. I mean, a fundamental constitutional right to protect ourselves. And so I'm still just not of the mind, and I agree with the sheriff. If we could have the law enforcement and we can fund it, the funding is a problem, though. I had legislation that fell four to three yesterday that had people that had military background, had police background. The option, I will say again, of doing nothing to me is, is just not an option. When they see that there's not a deadly force there with deadly force, I, a coward's more enticed on that, I think. Now, how are we going to get there? Hopefully we can have the paid enforcement. Till then, though, I'm still for having, having a presence where to, to, to deter them. Mr. Richard? Our public schools take every student that comes to the door, no matter what their Amen. problems are. Uh, hopefully the message tonight is that let's, let's work together, let's put a concerted yep. plan together with short-term deliverables and long-term deliverables and an identify, identified viable uh, financial resource from the state partnering with local governments to be able to attempt to address this very serious issue that's disrupting our schools across the state. All right, everybody. We have uh, run out of time uh, for our question and answer segment. It's been a great one. We'd like to thank our panelists, Sheriff Ard, Dr. Muller, Senator Reiser, and Mr. Richard for their insight in this, well, on this month's topic. When we come back, we're going to have a few closing comments for you. Well, Andre, what an interesting conversation. And the thing I'm most impressed about is the young people here in Louisiana yes. and around the country who are, feel so passionately. And I think maybe that's going to push some of us to do more. Yeah, feel passionately and speak eloquently. And they're so smart. Absolutely. Uh, good, I think good, good mind. that's all the time we have for this program this evening. We encourage you to visit our website at lpb.org slash public square to share your comments on tonight's show. We would love to hear from you. And on the next Louisiana Public Square, we explore the issue of balancing elder care. Internationally, there's a shift towards providing care for the elderly at home rather than institutions. But analysts say Louisiana has a bias towards nursing home enrollment through its funding and policies. So please join us for that important topic. And thanks so much for being here with us tonight. Good night. For a copy of this program, call 1-800-973-7246 or go online to www.lpb.org.